Ring is a popular series of books by Koji Suzuki following a deadly curse slash virus unleashed by an evil spirit, Sadako, that is spread by watching a videotape. It has received numerous film adaptations, from its homeland of Japan and even an American take on the series, The Ring, which was a huge hit and is undoubtedly responsible for the large wave of J-horror remakes from the early to mid-2000s. While many Westerners first encountered the series through the American remake, it wasn't the first piece of Ring-related media to make it stateside, as in September of 2000, American Dreamcast owners would get the survival horror title, The Ring. Terror's Realm. This is a rare game where you can guess the quality before the gameplay even starts. I mean, listen to the sound you hear when making selections in the main menu. Wow, so scary. Once you do actually start the game, you're treated to a very cheesy FMV set in an American neighborhood where the heroine of the story, Meg, discovers her boyfriend, Robert, has mysteriously died. You can probably guess the cause of this death. If you're a fan of awful voice acting, well, this game has you covered. Meg, Meg, what's going on over there? Like, hey man, what's happening here? Now hold on a moment, sir. I know the two of them, they're friends. What happened? Uh, I don't believe this. I see. Anyway, despite this death, Meg goes to her office the next day to work, and that's where the actual gameplay begins. Right away, you're confronted with some very loud and not quite scary music. This is also one of like four tracks in the whole game, so get ready to hear it a lot. At first, I really didn't like this music, but I'll admit, for some reason, the more I heard it, the more I got into it. The game's graphics are something else that stood out to me. No, they're not amazing, but for the first few minutes of playing, I actually thought they were pre-rendered, as you would have seen in a lot of similar games on the PS1 and Saturn. There's something about the way everything in the office looks that I swear it looks like a static image, and I thought they were doing something similar to the PS1 game Covert Ops Nuclear Dawn, which had 2D backgrounds that were a bit more dynamic than similar style games. But you actually can go into first person and see that everything you're looking at is in fact in 3D. So I guess that's the plus for the game. That said, this game is really slow to start. After looking around your office a bit, Meg uses the computer her boyfriend was using before he died and starts playing a game called, you guessed it, Ring. This brings her into a much grungier environment more in line with what you'd normally associate with survival horror, where you are now wearing some sort of futuristic military or police garb. You also get a weapon at this point. Hilariously, your commanding officer has you aim this weapon at him when teaching you how to use it. After this, he sends you upstairs to finally face your first enemy, you kill it, and you're back at the office. Somehow this game knocked you out while you were playing it. Totally not suspicious at all. From this point, you spend a lot of time running around the office building to talk to one character or another. I'm guessing this was done to increase the length of the game since all of this storytelling could have easily been done via phone calls. Though I guess you could make an argument that this was done to familiarize you with the game's environment, as it is where 100% of the game takes place. Still, it's basically just your boss and the building's security guard yelling at you for this or that as you investigate various rooms and talk to your other, less angry coworkers. These scenes are completely unvoiced by the way, which I guess isn't a bad thing considering what you hear in the CG cutscenes. After over 30 minutes of this running around, you re-enter the game, and this time, you get to stay a bit longer. If you hadn't already noticed, this is where you really start to realize that this game is a giant Resident Evil knockoff. I mean, this is what you see when you move from one room to the next. Thank you. 
There's also the game's character menu and inventory, which is nearly identical, as well as the controls. Hold the right trigger to aim and press A to shoot. It's got the typical survival horror tank controls as well. Though, man, do you move slow when not running, much more so than any Resident Evil game I can think of. Aside from the office scenes, the game's progression is basically identical as well. You slowly unlock new areas of the map by collecting keys, all while obtaining stronger weapons as you go. And yes, I know Alone in the Dark did that first, but that's clearly not where this game got its inspiration. It's not just Resident Evil this game seems to be borrowing from though. The office scenes really give me a strong Clock Tower vibe, specifically that game's investigation sections, including some that put you in an office. There's some Silent Hill in there too, because after not too long, you start to realize that the game world is a grimier and darker version of the office you've been running around, with a nearly identical layout. Also, there's the fact that you use a flashlight while in the game world. If you turn it off, it's harder for enemies to spot you, just like in Silent Hill. Though, I didn't quite feel the same sense of terror when in the dark as in those games. And for some dumb reason, you have to worry about your flashlight's battery. I guess that's what they did to differentiate the game from Silent Hill, but I wish they hadn't considering these batteries take up precious inventory space. Really, the game handles the enemy flashlight system pretty poorly. With it off, you basically have to step right in front of an enemy for them to notice you. Otherwise, they just stand there. Sometimes annoyingly so, as they'll be stationed right in front of a door you need to enter. All the enemies really seem programmed to do is walk towards you when you enter their line of sight. You can use this to your advantage in fact. Line up an obstacle between you and the monster and fire away. Lastly, it might be worth mentioning that the design of these enemies isn't like anything you'd see in the previously mentioned games and they're definitely not in the source material. I guess they look a bit more like what you'd see in Parasite Eve than anything else from the time, so this game really does seem to be borrowing from everything. Eventually, you do regain power and get the option to turn on the lights in the game world, which definitely makes things less scary. Though, I wasn't exactly on the edge of my seat before this. It's kind of funny how they started with the creepier atmosphere, though I guess this was done to make it less obvious that the game world was your office, cause I actually didn't notice at first. I'll admit, I do kind of like how they make you slowly realize this on your own. As the game goes, it follows a pattern. You explore the game world and fight monsters, then explore the real world to further investigate your boyfriend's death. As I mentioned before, in the real world, your boss and the place's security guard keep yelling at you which makes it seem like you work at an extremely shitty company. Shouldn't the guard be more worried about people who don't work there? Well, it turns out it's because they're hiding terrible secrets related to the ring virus. In fact, they're keeping Sadako's body in the place's basement in order to gain control of the curse for their own use. On top of that, Sadako's mom keeps following you around in child form for some reason in both worlds. Eventually, she begins communicating with you and it is revealed, in a face palmingly stupid twist, that the real world is the game world and the game world is the real world. And your boyfriend is supposedly alive? You don't see him though. You also get a scene where you're shown the infamous cursed tape footage from the Japanese Ring movie. While the film did have screenings before this game's western release, it wasn't made widely available through home video until 2003, so that would actually make this the first time this footage was officially viewable for an English speaking audience. So I guess that's at least one thing that makes this game noteworthy. Anyway, after this big reveal, you're sent back to the real world. N game world. The non grimy version of the office one final time with the goal of defeating Sadako to put a stop to the ring virus. So up until this point, there were healing items and ammo that you occasionally found in the non grimy world, which did seem odd. I initially thought you'd be able to transport these items to the grimy world via the game's item boxes, but 
that wasn't the case, as when you go between worlds, you'll see the items don't cross over. I guess it was foreshadowing the big dumb reveal. Actually, this is incredibly annoying, as you get a ton of weapons in the grimy world. From a shotgun, to a machine gun, to a bazooka you can get by finding all of its parts. I didn't even get to use this bazooka though, because I figured I should save it for the final encounter, but nope. Instead, you're left with a pistol and the ammo and health packs you've been collecting until then. There's also a katana you can find. Still, I wouldn't be surprised if there is a way to bring these items into the non grimy world, because the guide I'd been using for this game wasn't exactly the most well written or detailed. I can't complain too much though, good on the author for putting up with this game. That said, at this point you get to see one of the game's few voiced cutscenes, in which your asshole boss rambles on about his evil intentions or something. I couldn't really focus on what he was saying, because for some reason they artificially lowered his voice. Chief? Just another effort. One more step and the work is over. I'll be the one who controls the virus. Virus what? I guess his normal tone wasn't intimidating enough? Also, why does this even matter if this is actually the virtual world? Oh well. After you face him in a fight that can easily be beaten by putting a desk between the two of you, you head up to the building's roof where you confront none other than Sadako herself in a pretty lame final battle. In this battle, she uses her trademark hair attack. Freddy Krueger has his knife gloves, Jason has his machete, Sadako whips her hair at you. Wait, that's not what she does? She also turns into crows a few times, though that at least feels a bit more fitting. Well, you kill her, return to the grimy world, and get a closing shot that seems to imply a sequel. That of course never came. Afterwards, the credits roll and you hear the same music that played during the final boss. Yeah, as I said, there's only like four tracks in this game. One of the dudes in the credits lists their name as Muneyuki Tejima? Question mark? Like, just in case the game turned out to be terrible, they could be like, no, it doesn't say for sure that I worked on it. And yeah, it is pretty terrible. The amount of pointless running around you're tasked with in the non-grimy world would be enough to make a lot of people quit, but there's also the boring enemies and head-scratching design decisions. Like, why are the item boxes almost always in different rooms than the save radios? If you're going to steal from Resident Evil, steal the things that work! Also, why do you save using CB radios to begin with? How does that make sense with the office setting? And why give us these super powerful weapons in the grimy world if there's no obvious way to use them against the final boss? Like, you have to go through a lot of steps to get that bazooka. Lastly, this is a terrible adaptation of the Ring series. It doesn't have any of the same vibe or atmosphere from the movies. I get that they are attempting to imitate the source with the investigation segments, but they don't do anything to make those parts interesting, fun, or really active on the player's part. There are absolutely no puzzles or problem solving, just a bunch of running back and forth with none of the mystery solving left to the player. Taking place in America is a strange choice as well. I guess this was done for the sake of a potential western release, but it seems unnecessary considering they still kept the very Japanese characters and backstory. Well, I guess this was at a time when most games with a super Japanese setting would miss out on getting a localization, so it might have been done as a precaution. Now, there are some positives. It actually did make me jump a few times mainly because of how the monsters silently stand there until they see you. If you're in an area with no lights, or they happen to be just off camera, them suddenly lunging at you may just freak you out a bit. I also like how, unlike Resident Evil, 
the save rooms aren't completely safe, as there was a moment where I was in one and suddenly the lights turned off and one of the smaller monsters started attacking me. I definitely wasn't expecting that. Luckily, it's not done too often, so it's not the annoyance it could be. And I do like the slow realization that the supposed game world and your office are one and the same. It's something that I wouldn't mind seeing in a more well-made horror game. Still, I don't think most people would be able to put up with this game. Horror fans may want to check it out for novelty's sake, but I can't think of many people I'd actually recommend it to. Well, maybe diehard fans of the Ring series who want to see what may be the worst way the series was ever handled. But if Ring fans are looking for a game based on the series, there actually was one more. In August of 2000, six months after Terror's Realm's Japanese release and one month before its localization, Ring would get its second game with the Wonderswan title, Ring Infinity. Now, you might be asking, what's a Wonderswan? Well, Wonderswan was a 16-bit portable game console made by Bandai that was released in 1999 as a sort of successor to the Tamagotchi. It competed with the Game Boy Color, and later, the Game Boy Advance. The system initially launched with only a black and white screen, with the trade-off being that it was priced very reasonably, being at an equivalent of less than $50. It also only needed a single AA battery to run. It did, however, quickly get a color version, and later, the Swan Crystal, which was the same as the color, but with a nicer screen. That said, I don't have an actual Swan Crystal to show, as the Wonder Swan and Wonder Swan Color I have are both modded to have backlit screens, which kind of negates my need to get one. Despite never getting a Western release, the Wonder Swan had a fairly solid library, which included a partnership with Squaresoft, who opted for it over Nintendo's outings. Here's a port of the first entry in the previously mentioned Clock Tower series that was made for the system. It actually had a decent library of horror titles for a handheld. One interesting thing that the Wonderswan does is that games can play in the typical horizontal fashion or vertically, as you are seeing here with the puzzle game Gunpei. Another cool thing, the system had cross-game capabilities with the PlayStation's very own Pocket Station via infrared data transferring. This was used for multiple Bandai published games in the Digimon and SD Gundam series. In fact, the PlayStation partnership didn't end there, as Sony went as far as developing portable versions of several of their series for the system. Here's Double Dice, and here's an exclusive entry to the very underappreciated Arc the Lad series. Maybe this was them testing the waters before going all in with the PSP. And what may be even more impressive is that the system had a very early form of DLC using something known as the Mobile Wondergate. In conjunction with a cell phone, you could use it to download new content for various games. I don't have a phone that can connect to it, though that doesn't quite matter since the service has long since ended. But yeah, it was a very unique handheld and it stuck around until 2003. There's a lot more I could go into, but that's probably better left to its own video. Anyway, let's take a look at Ring Infinity. In contrast to Terror's Realm, which gives you a bad impression almost immediately with its squishing sound effect, Ring Infinity does the opposite, giving you a creepy strobing title screen and an even creepier main menu theme. Something about that lo-fi sound works incredibly well in setting the mood. The game is a visual novel which begins at a high school with you taking the role of one of its students. Just like in the movies, you hear stories of the cursed tape, 
And also, just like in the movies, you shrug it off as dumb rumors. Well, in a turn of events you'll likely see coming, you end up seeing the tape. Unlike Terror's Realm, which straight up just shows the footage from the movie, Infinity has its very own take on the tape, showing you something that's reminiscent of the footage without being a one-to-one -one copy. And what you see is fairly effective. A crying baby, a collage of faces, and, as you'd expect, the well where Sadako resides. After seeing this scene, I kind of realized the Wonder Swan's monochrome screen actually works incredibly well in the game's favor. It completely matches the black and white presentation of the cursed tape as shown in the films, and gives a sort of bleak vibe that you wouldn't quite get had it been in color. Anyway, from this point, just like in the movies, you're trying to save yourself from getting killed by the curse while making decisions that may or may not lead to your demise, such as what to investigate and who to show the tape to if you decide that's what you want to do. Make the wrong choice, and the game may just end in your death. Though that may be fitting considering the source. In my case, I got to a less than happy ending in under two hours. So yes, it is a short game, but there is some definite replay value. In fact, remember the mobile Wondergate? This was one of the games that supported it. Using the device, you could get an additional story told from the point of view of another character. Unfortunately though, I'm not sure if there's any way to currently get a hold of that content. It may just be lost to media. In terms of console games based on Ring, of which there are only two, yeah, this is undoubtedly the best. It gets the presentation right, it gets the story right, it feels like what a game based on the series should be. Now, the fact that the game is only available in Japanese is a definite barrier to entry. In my case, I only had a basic understanding of what was going on, as my Japanese level is, I'll admit, extremely low. I also did ask a native speaker to give the game a playthrough to get a second opinion. Still, even without any understanding of Japanese, it might be worth giving the game a try to take in its atmospheric visuals and music, and see its take on the cursed tape. Viewing imagery like this on an old handheld is not something you get to experience often. While Ring has yet to receive a new console adaptation since the year 2000, it has received several mobile games, as well as an unofficial VR game, Sadako VR. If you're looking for more recent gaming takes on the series, you may want to check them out. As for the two games in this video, well, if you want to give them a try, neither is exactly cheap. In recent years, Terror's Realm has shot up quite a bit in price much more so than I'd say a game of its quality is worth. Though, any game going for more than its original retail price is kinda bullshit. Infinity, on the other hand, is a bit more reasonable if you buy it in Japan like I did, but it gets pretty expensive if you try buying it from abroad. Therefore, I'd recommend finding other ways to play them, if you know what I mean. I will say, it is a bit of a shame that the better of the two games is locked to the Japanese language. I'm not sure whether or not it would be possible for the game, but if we ever received a fan translation of Infinity, that would certainly make it more accessible. I do think it is a game that would be worth receiving one. Now, will Ring ever get a new console adaptation? With the 20 plus years in technological advancements, I think some very cool things could be done with the series. It could definitely work as a Telltale or Zero Escape style adventure game. Still, considering the only two games it received were on systems that were notable failures, it may be for the best that we don't get another one. The Ring Curse may very well be real. This was my second series review, with more planned for release in the future. If you enjoyed this, be sure to subscribe to see new entries as they come out. 
Fans of the channel may also want to consider supporting it on Patreon for early access footage, a chance to pick games for review, and more. Well, with that said, I guess it's time we wrapped things up. As always, thanks for watching The Legend of Games.